Welcome back to the Mayo Clinic Cardiovascular Podcast Series, Interviews with the Experts. I'm your host, Sharon Hayes. I'm a non-invasive cardiologist and vice chair of faculty development and academic advancement for the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine here in Rochester, Minnesota. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Anna Spadakova. She is a preventive cardiologist and echocardiographer and does research in the area of sleep and cardiovascular medicine. Our topic today is how does sleep loss affect your heart? So welcome, Anna. Thank you for having me on this podcast, Sharon. Yeah. So recently, the American Heart Association updated the Life Simple 7 metrics to measure cardiovascular health. And now it's the Life's Essential 8, adding healthy sleep as an essential for optimal cardiovascular health. And so we've got the behaviors, nicotine exposure, physical activity, and diet. And then we've got risk factors, weight, blood glucose, cholesterol, blood pressure, and now we've added sleep. So what is some of the evidence for sleep being important for our heart health? Yeah, great question. Thanks, uh, Sharon. Uh, that's right. The um, AHA extended the Life Simple 7 to include the sleep, and now um, it's Life Essential 8. Uh, sleep is likely the most effective thing we can do every day to reset the health of our brain and the body. And probably it led also to the incorporation of sleep into the metrics. Multiple data suggests that sleep health benefits cardiovascular health. We have learned that normal sleep provides time for low physiological stress. It's time for resetting and recovering our cardiovascular system. We know a lot about obstructive sleep apnea or central sleep apnea, but this goes beyond apneic sleep. It's about insufficient and short sleep that a lot of um, population is suffering from. And these are big risk factors for heart disease. Recent epidemiological studies um, are showing that sleep loss is associated with increased risk of obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, ischemic heart disease, stroke, but also with cancer um, causing immunodeficiency or leading to neuropsychiatric disorders. Um, so if it's abnormal sleep, like sleep apnea, or if it's insufficient sleep, both are important, but we are recognizing that we have probably lost track of the insufficient sleep and it has been a forgotten risk factor for uh, heart disease and we need to start paying attention to it. Yeah, and we doctors need to pay attention because honestly, much of our career, we were like, wow, I can go for 32 hours without sleep and take care of patients. And I realized several years ago, that was the risk factor that I was really falling short of. Um, and, and probably we can all, all look to that personally. Um, tell us briefly what happens during different stages of sleep and how it might influence cardiovascular regulation. Yeah, that's an important question. We don't, you know, talk about it a lot. But um, as a reminder from, you know, med school, there are two main, main types of sleep. The non-REM sleep has four stages, um, stages one to four, and they correlate with increasing depth of sleep. Um, during the deeper stages of sleep, there's an increase in the parasympathetic tone. So as we go from the stages one to four, our blood pressure goes down, heart rate goes down, and respiratory drive slows down. And also the electrical activity of the brain starts to slow down. Now, during REM sleep, which is also called the dream sleep, that's important typically for um consolidation of information, experiences that we gained the day before, and we are storing it in our memory. But physiologically, during the REM sleep, there are surges in sympathetic activity and transient increases in blood pressure and heart rate, as well as increased respiratory drive. And our sleep is structured into these 90-minute cycles, and each cycle has different amount of non-REM and REM sleep. So the physiology, physiology that happens during these stages is very important when it pertains to um, cardiovascular health. So how does then short sleep or not getting enough or maybe not getting enough of these stages, what does that do to us? Yeah, so... 
As I mentioned, the ratio of the non-REM and REM sleep in the 90-minute cycles changes um, as the night progresses. Um, early on, we have a more of the deeper non-REM sleep. And then in the second part of the night, most of the 90 minutes is occupied by the REM sleep or uh, stage, stage two or three um, sleep. Um, so... Let's say you typically go to bed at 10 p.m. and you wake up at 6 a.m. So you get eight hours of sleep. But yesterday you had to I wake wish. up at <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yesterday you woke up at four to complete a task or uh, to catch a flight. You woke up at 4 a.m. So um, how much sleep did you lose? Um, we can say, okay, two hours, so 25% of the sleep. But because we truncated the second part of the sleep, which is so heavy for during for REM sleep, you actually lost 50 to, you may lose as much as 50 or 60% of all REM sleep. And this short sleep has real consequences. Not only that, um, changes in sleep duration may prevent a typical dipping in blood pressure or lowering blood pressure during sleep, but also losing the REM sleep may reflect poor quality of sleep and uh, depriving ourselves from the REM sleep not only leading may not only lead to cognitive problems, but um, there are studies that show plasma levels of oxidative stress markers, inflammatory markers are going up, accelerating myocardial necrosis and fibrosis. Um, therefore, we should pay attention to the length of our sleep and quality of our sleep. So is there evidence that there's like a, an optimal length of sleep? Yeah, so the American Academy of Sleep Medicine recommends seven to nine hours per night for optimal adult uh, health. Um, and so that implies that if we don't get enough sleep, then we might have all of those things about myocardial necrosis that we have increased risk of cardiovascular disease, hypertension. Um, what are the specific things that may be an outcome from insufficient sleep? Yeah, so that's what epidemiological observational and experimental data are showing. And more recent cross-sectional study um, from the Enhanced Database showed that sleeping less than six hours reduced the ads of sufficient blood pressure control, even if patients were on antihypertensive therapy. So adequate sleep duration may be important addition to hypertension management. Um, recent study at Mayo um, done by Dr. Kovacin and colleagues uh, did a very elegant experimental study when they subjected 20 young, healthy adults to four hours of sleep for nine days. And then in crossover um, uh, study, they did a nine-hour experimental sleep. So either four hours or nine hours of sleep. What they found, interestingly, was a sex-specific increase in blood pressure in women who were sleep-deprived. Those that were sleeping four hours per night um, had uh, their 24 hour systolic blood pressure was eight millimeter mercury higher, and their um, nighttime systolic blood pressure was up 11 millimeters mercury. Hmm. Substantial. Substantial. Um, why the reason for the sex specific uh, increases? It's still a work in progress, but perhaps some hormonal changes in women may play a role. Um, in addition, there are studies that show that sleeping less than six hours uh, per night or having fragmented sleep are independently associated with atherosclerosis in non-coronary vessels and um, higher cholesterol plaque burden in the carotid femoral arteries have been documented. Um, so it may increase risk of subclinical atherosclerosis as well. So, you know, I think... It say we're all going to hear your message and we're all going to try to get our eight hours of sleep every night, but there are going to be times like getting up for a flight where we're going to have occasional sleep deprivation. Um, what is What are the risks for perhaps a healthy person, but maybe somebody who's got some risk factors or coronary disease for that occasional? Is that a problem? Right. So this is a very common scenario and we are all part of it, like you said. And the, the, the main one is simply the transition to and from daylight saving time. Mm -hmm. So in the seven days after the spring transition, when we lose an hour of sleep, 
Um, multiple studies uh, documented significant rise in cardiac events. Uh, the circadian misalignment from losing one hour of sleep, which seems so benign, has been associated with up to 30% increase in, in acute MI. Um, admissions to the emergency department with atrial fibrillation has been up 40% in the seven days after the um, spring transition or daylight saving time. Uh, stroke risk goes up to 20%, increased risk of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Um, so these numbers are pretty profound, and therefore we really need to focus on getting the recommended seven to nine hours of sleep for optimum adult health. That's actually kind of scary. So I, I'm it just, is. <laughs> yeah. It um, is, yeah. So switching gears just a little bit, we, nobody's getting enough sleep. Everybody I know complains about my patients, my friends. So we've got an epidemic of sleep deprivation and an epidemic of obesity. Mm -hmm. um, are those two connected? Yeah, um, great question. And um, when we look at the map of United States, um, where is the obesity highest? When is the sleep deprivation highest? Actually, the Southeast states uh, really overlap. So there's a huge interplay between obesity and sleep deprivation. And this is also supported by research studies. Um, in the nurses' health study, um, uh, over 68,000 women were part of um, those that reported. Um, habitually sleeping less than five hours per night, uh, they were on average 2.5 kilograms heavier at baseline. And then when they followed this, um, um, uh, these women for the next uh, 15, 16 years, they also noted that they continued to increase their weight more rapidly compared to those that were sleeping more than seven hours. And interestingly, those women that were sleeping less than five hours per night were 32% more likely to have 15 kilogram weight gain during that particular uh, decade. Um, there are other cross-sectional studies that show inverse relationship between BMI and sleep duration. And interestingly, for each hour of less sleep, um, an association with increased BMI was noted of 1.22 so each hour of less sleep was associated with 1.22 greater BMI. Now, yeah. So do we understand the mechanism for this? I mean, is it just because they're awake and can have longer period to eat or is yeah. it hormonal? Or Yeah, um, probably. Right? I mean, the, the, there's a lot of things that could be going into that. Right. Um, it is thought to be mediated by uh, cardiometabolic dysregulation uh, hormones mm -hmm. like um, ghrelin and leptin. And a study done at Mayo um, recently, again, by Dr. Kovas and Dr. Sommers and colleagues, uh, they did a very interesting study when they now restricted participants to four hours of sleep for two weeks versus letting them sleep for nine hours per night. So it was a crossover design. And they indeed showed that those that were sleeping only four hours per night ate more than uh, 300 calories extra uh, per day. They gained more weight. They ate more or they, they had more fat intake by 17% more fat, higher protein. But interestingly, the expenditure didn't change. They did not change their level of activity. Um, again, the thought is that the hormones play their role. The key ones we should be aware of is ghrelin and leptin. Uh, ghrelin is the hunger hormone and leptin is the satiety hormone. So when we are sleep deprived, our ghrelin, the hunger hormone goes up and leptin, the satiety hormone goes down. And, um, it appears that probably this hormonal dysregulation and cardiometabolic dysregulation plays an important role. It's really interesting. I just remember when I was on call, if I was awake at two in the morning, I was starving, even if I'd eaten something. So I, yeah, I, and I, we would this, eat high I would fat eat. meals, right? Yeah. You know, yeah, cafeteria really has, great. you know, uh, the greasy fee, uh, food. <laughs> so, 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 I mean, we know that people who work shift work, particularly at night, um, have higher accident rates and other adverse health outcomes. Um, so how does this sleep either short sleep or disrupted or rotating shifts, how does that figure into cardiovascular disease? Yeah, so shift workers do indeed experience significant circadian misalignment or what we call uncoupling between their biological clock and occupational schedule. And this actually involves about 28% of workforce in the United States. 
so it's and a big. large part of the the healthcare workforce. Right. Um, and this work schedule, um, working at night and changing our exposure to light and daytime and nighttime has been linked to a myriad of medical conditions such as increasing obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, as well as cancer. And the being exposed to nocturnal light disrupts simply the melatonin release and other neuro, neuroendocrine responses, as well as some other physiological metabolic derangements. And these may have the adverse health consequences for shift workers. It's all the rage that whether it's a wearable device or a bed that's smart, but all these things yeah. that measure, right, that measure sleep or pro- proposed to measure sleep or sleep quality or duration. They're really yeah. popular. Yes. Um, are they accurate and do they serve any benefit to our patients or to us as improving sleep or giving us accurate feedback on sleep? Yeah. Over the past few decades, there has been such a rapid rise in the number of the variable sleep trackers or mobile apps, the Apple Watch, Fitbit, Aura Ring, and the technology has really come a long way. Um, Research so far is actually promising. For instance, some data suggests that a a multi-sensor tracker can provide insight that is fairly close to that obtained by polysomnography. So the testing that the sleep laboratories use to uh, look at your sleep architecture. Um, The sleep tracking technologies allow users to track their sleep quality at home. Um, They may pay attention to their daily sleep habits and the sleep environment, Uh, but we have to keep in mind that each sleep tracker is unique and the accuracy varies. Um, It is important that um, to note, and I feel that the sleep trackers promote general well-being and better sleep hygiene and uh, improve sleep quality. Um, f- first and foremost, they, I guess, motivate people to attain healthy sleep habits. Um, However, it may not be for everybody. Uh, Tracking one's sleep can also introduce some stress or physical discomfort and potentially lead to adverse outcomes. Also, like you pointed out, Sharon, um, sleep tracker is um, not a replacement for medical evaluation evaluation primarily in the elderly people when we really are worried about presence of sleep apnea, obstructive central sleep apnea, or patients with chronic medical conditions. So it might help us raise awareness of the need to sleep, but we could get so focused on it, just like, you know, people getting focused on their ECG and and developing some anxiety about um, about the the readings of their device. Right. So let's wrap this up. Um, Give us some top tips to improve our sleep, to advise our patients on how to improve their sleep and particularly uh, focusing on those that might have the biggest bang for cardiovascular health since we're cardiologists. Yeah. So my top three things, going to sleep at regular time, around the same time of the day. Second, sleep in a dark, quiet, cool environment and shut off blue light devices, iPads, iPhones, as those hinder and delay the melatonin production. Those would be the top three. Um, Remember, we all have to remember that sleep is an essential part of our life. Um, It occupies about a third of our life, and good restorative sleep is important for cardiovascular health. Thanks for that great advice. Very practical and um, motivating, I think. Uh, So this wraps up this week's episode of Interviews with the Experts. I'd really like to thank Dr. Svatakova for joining us today and discussing this important topic. Thank you, Sharon. Great to be here and part of this cardiology podcast series. We look forward to you joining us next week for another interview with the expert. Be well.